uh, I wanted to uh, to parse this uh, catalog, uh, company's catalog, yeah, mm -hmm. and everything went good until uh, one important piece of information, the phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, was not a text based, but it was an image. Okay. So the, the, they try to protect uh, the data that way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that was kind of challenge. Um, how so did you? What what to do? <laughs> yeah. How did you uh, solve that? I came up with the solution just to use some OCR uh, technology like Tesseract. O o OCR um, is what exactly? It's optical character recognition. Yeah, basically, oh, you can recognize characters from image. Or... Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the OxyCast, the podcast show where we talk about everything web scraping related. Today's episode is about parsing and I don't think that there are a lot of people better suited to talk about this topic than my colleague that's sitting here on the other side of this table. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Povelis. Uh, I'm software engineer here at Ox Labs and I've been doing web scraping for well quite some, some time now. And that particular sentence that you've been doing web scraping for quite some time now that is exactly why I think that you're the best person for this particular topic because I remember talking to you previously and you told me about your like how your career started in general and that you've been doing like web scraping and parsing for pretty much forever can you tell us a little bit about well, that forever it's quite a, a strong word but uh, yeah actually in general my path to, to the software engineering wasn't this traditional one one. Uh, I remember the first book I got was uh, when I was 13 years old, it was uh, Turbo Pascal. It's all programming language. Yeah, I've heard about that one. No, it's, yeah. Um, and then the passion for software engineering kind of uh, appeared. Uh, but I always thought that uh, maybe it's not for me because uh, you have to be, I had this imagination that you have to be very good at math. Uh, you have to be this geeky person or, or whatever. No. Uh, so I kind of laid aside that, that, um, that dream. Uh, and then into like business because I liked sales, I liked marketing, so I started studying business uh, and then eventually opened my own business. And it was going quite well uh, for some time, but later on I just uh, well, I had to close it and found myself with this uh, pretty scary situation where you don't know what's, what's next, you know, what you're gonna do, who you are and so on. Uh, so my friend offered me to go to Norway to work in this fish factory. Oh, okay. And I thought, okay, maybe it's like a good time for me, yeah, just to figure out uh, what to do next. Uh, just have some time, you know, yeah, earn some money, 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 money. So I took that opportunity and uh, yeah, so I started working in this uh, Norway town in a fish factory. And to be fair, it was well, a very you know, harsh environment. I was working in this warehouse. It's, it's freezing cold. Physically, it was hard, uh, but most, mostly mentally, it was hard because, you no, know, I just, I just got probably a bit different vision, uh, what I want to do, you know. So uh, that gave me a lot of motivation to to just pursue my old uh, passion you know, for software engineering. So I worked uh, shifts. Uh, in the day and in the evening I was uh, studying uh, Python programming language. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was for almost nine months, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, so, you know, when you're learning uh, software engineering, uh, at some point you think, I don't know anything. Then you learn something and then I'm, I'm gonna, I can build anything now. Yeah, <laughs> that feeling. Much. So I was uh, that feeling uh, where I think I can do anything. Uh, and uh, so I went on and looked for some uh, freelance jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got some, uh, just re realizing that, okay, I actually don't have the skill to, to, to deliver those. Uh, so I had to study even more. Uh, but yeah, so those freelance jobs that I got uh, was actually web scraping. So that's wow. how I got into the web scraping field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and okay, you had to do a few of these like web scraping jobs. So what do you think about them? Were they like easy? Were they hard or? I mean, there's uh, different cases. Uh, though some, some was easy, you know. We have great frameworks uh, in Python uh, programming language for building uh, scrapers, but uh, some, some, some jobs are, uh, yeah, it's, some jobs are hard. 
Okay. So when you say that like some jobs are easy, can you give me a, an easy example maybe of, of yeah. a, like since we're talking about parsing, I want you to focus on the parsing part of, of the job. Can you give me like some examples of something that was like super easy to do? When it comes I mean, to parsing? in general talking, like it's easy to, let's say have some microservice, yeah, mm -hmm. which uh, takes an input and uh, HTML and spits out a JSON. So it, it kind of easy to, to build such a microservice. You, we just need like a library to build uh, an element tree, you know, from our source uh, HTML. Why would you need an element tree in the first place? Well, uh, you see like HTML is a hierarchical structure, yeah, mm -hmm. which can be represented as a tree. And uh, uh, to be able to, but as a tree in, in sense that a, a trunk would be like a top HTML element. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have two branches, like head and body branch, and that body branch will, will branch out into more branches. So that's representable as an element tree. And when we have this kind of object, we can uh, access it, uh, access the, the, the branches and the elements. Yeah, but I'm just like wondering, using selectors. why can't you use like any sort of um, string searching algorithm? Them to just find the parts that you're interested in. Why would you actually need something like an elementary in the first place? Because it's it's um, well, you might use like regex, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, to access some some part of it, uh, but it's really not efficient because like with regex, regex is more like for working with uh, text and when you want to find some string in that text. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we have a website, it's very dynamic. It's like life organism, it changes constantly. Layout is changing. Uh, so it would be super hard to write, uh, you know, sustainable regex that would work all the time. Okay. So that's when we have the elementary and we can use like selectors to access uh, different objects. So What's a selector? Well, you can think about it as a, as a like, query language, mm -hmm. which we can use, uh, write a pattern and, and use that query language to uh, query and get some element in that element tree. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you have a selector, you use that sort of, that selector thing to select a particular element from the element tree, which is actually the HTML that you got yeah, earlier. Yeah, in this case, yeah. Right. Um, Okay, tell me more about these selectors. Like, um, is there just one type of selector or are there multiple types of selectors uh, or? There's not a lot of types of selectors. We have two main selectors, which would be like CSS selector mm -hmm. and XPAD selector. And uh, well, in Oxlabs, we use XPAD all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's no like clear advantage. Uh, uh, it's more of the type of preference, which one you choose. I would probably mention on XPath it has like function contains, mm -hmm. which allows you to select an element based on uh, text it has, mm -hmm. which sometimes can be useful. Uh, the other part is that with XPath you can traverse um, up through the element tree. Mm -hmm. That means that you can uh, select the parent of the child. Okay. Uh, you cannot do that with a CSS selector. And last but probably not least would be uh, the community in web scraping. Mm -hmm. Like in web scraping, XPath is, is a bit uh, uh, more popular, so you would get more examples, more help uh, when you use XPath. More links and Stack Overflow. And exactly. All that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so you have a selector, which can be XPath or CSS selectors. Um, and is regex, oh, so regex is not like one of those elementary selectors? because it doesn't work with element trees, right? Exactly, you cannot say that Regex is, is a selector. Okay. Um, well, I guess we could show a little example of uh, how an XPath or how a CSS selector looks on screen, which mm. will do that if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you should see a little image right here. Um, I'm also interested in like, when should you use like each of those? You mentioned it's a matter of preference. Is that all there is to it or? Uh, basically, yeah, it's, okay. it's actually, I, I mean, uh, if you are someone who's listening using CSS selector, the, the, there's no 
uh, strong reason to switch to XPath. No, but mm -hmm. if you have an uh, option to to choose now which one, I would personally I would recommend XPath because of the reasons I mentioned before. Oh, okay, so I guess it's easy when all you have is like a minimal case where you need to um, find like some specific elements in in like some HTML code. Um, Personally, I've had like these situations where, um, you know, as you mentioned before, websites are usually a, a sort of an organism, right? They constantly change because, well, they are, it's usually generated content, right? And it depends, like the content of the website depends on the sort of like descriptions a product has if we're talking about some e-commerce websites. Um, and if we're come, talking about SEO websites, then, you know, the amount of results that we could get, yeah. you know, could be different. How do you write a selector that withstands all of those changes? Mm. That's, that's a very good question, actually, because um, there is a difference, you know, you, it, to write... I can give you a, a, a good, bad a selector example. So okay. if you go to the browser, uh, you open the developer tools, and you select some element in the uh, in the DOM tree, you would uh, and right click uh, on it, uh, you would get an option to copy uh, XPath. Mm -hmm. so that would be a, a really bad example of of the of why is it bad? Because it won't sustain. Uh, I mean, it won't survive any turbulence of the website. Okay. Something could change, uh, and and that's it. So any single change will make that particular XPath string yeah. invalid. Yeah, you could think about it like uh, in a city if you want to find some building and for your taxi driver you describe the road so you would say you would, wouldn't would give uh, uh, the coordinates uh, or address you would say you know, okay now go straight uh, three blocks and at the third road you turn right and so on and uh, so that's same with bad uh, XPath, you know, you, you, if you have a straight direct uh, directions uh, to the element you're right. particularly interested. Uh, if some road is closed, the taxi driver is going to be lost, yeah, because some change in the, in the, in the, um, in the road is. But I've also had like these particular scenarios where you can't really give your taxi driver an address. Um, sometimes there's just nothing to hook on. You know, it's great that when your website has like a specific ID on that HTML element, you can just say, hey, find me an element in the DOM tree that has this particular ID, right? Mm. So those kind of situations are easy to deal with. But what about um, when the data is like in a super generic element, like a U UL, right? Mm. Which is a, a, a numbered list element, right? I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Sorry if I'm mistaken. Um, so how do you write an XPath that would withstand the turbulence of, you know, a changing website, but um, the XPath could still find the particular element that you're, you know, thinking about? Well, the example you gave is actually would be a pretty bad HTML and it's not that often that you would find like a list of elements uh, without any class or attribute mm -hmm. on which you could you know hook your, your uh, selector. So um, yeah, you just have to have to find a way uh, to look for those classes and attributes or some particular text that you could uh, uh, that you could use to select mm -hmm. an element. So am I understanding you correctly that if there's like no particular class that you can hook on to in order to find that particular particular element that you're interested in? So you're basically lost. You can't really. Uh, if you're not it. lost. You could probably say that okay, I need a third element in this uh, wow. list. Yeah. yeah, but that's that's very uh, well dangerous. No, because if another element uh, will appear in that list, that's it. <laughs> I choked on water for a bit there. <laughs> um, okay, so all of this is like still like the easy case for for when we from when we are talking about parsing in general what about the hard cases can you think of like something that was um you know still parsing related but um situations where parsing a specific piece of data from an html website was kind of hard i mean there was uh, some cases one thing that comes to my mind is like uh, i wanted to uh, to parse this 
uh, catalog, uh, company's catalog, yeah. Mm-hmm. And everything went good until uh, one important piece of information, the phone number, mm-hmm. uh, was not a text based, but it was an image. Oh, okay. So the, the, they try to protect uh, the data that way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that was kind of challenge. Um, how so did you? What what to do? <laughs> yeah. How did you solve uh, that? I came up with the solution just to use some OCR uh, technology like Tesseract. O- o- OCR um, is what exactly? It's optical character recognition. Yeah, basically, oh, you can recognize characters from image or. Okay. Yeah. So. It, so you it had took to, some time, you know. You had like, to download every yeah, single one of uh, those images yeah, and run like, it through like match. some piece of software that would recognize the phone numbers from yeah. those particular images yeah exactly so it took some time i had to like tweak the settings uh, because i didn't have like previous experience before i'm pretty sure that i came up well, i stumbled upon tesseract in the past um and you know my particular scenario was a bit different um my ex-girlfriend used to work as a as a translations coordinator she would often get um, requests from her clients to translate like some documents, basically. Rather than translating the documents herself, she would have to, you know, find a translator that would do those mm-hmm. particular documents. But that's besides the point. The point is that once in a while she would get like these documents that were actually images. Yeah. And so, you know, translators don't like to work with images. They, you know, have their specific pieces of software that helps them to um, basically, um, map out specific words into mm-hmm. into translated phrases that they've done in the past. And you know, I used Tesseract, I believe, as well, and it just didn't work for that particular use case because the accuracy of it was horrible, really. I mean, it was better than nothing, but but this was scanned document or it was like an. I'm pretty sure that it was a scanned document, and that the, might be a problem, you know, uh, because the quality is a bit uh, different, but. Uh, uh, in my case it was quite easy because it wasn't like um it was just a, a string uh, of digits uh, converted to the image mm-hmm. so it was pretty pretty good quality you know so all it took to me is just to find the right settings you know to get that uh, string okay so if I'm understanding you correctly, all you had to do is just play around with the Tesseract settings yeah. and, and that was basically it. Yeah. But just well, what was your accuracy? Point. Do you remember? It was very high. I think close to 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, one or two images, uh, the fact that you didn't... Is translating the right word? Well, let's assume it is. Converting, maybe. Parsing? <laughs> parsing? Or parsing, yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, one or two um, incorrectly parsed images weren't a big deal for your particular case. Yeah. I mean, parsing is, yeah, it's, it's a big topic. There's different uh, cases. Um, like, uh, now I remember it. One, one uh, more case that we have, like, with this, with one of the search engines, we have this case where the HTML source is not, well, how do I say it? It's like not, not complete or the data is there in the source, but it's uh, hidden in JavaScript uh, objects and code, which is in, in the same HTML. So yeah, it's kind of uh, edge case, but uh, but uh, was a... Well, from what I know, like these particular cases at the very least in Oxylabs, they are usually solved by just having a headless browser. So we're basically running an actual browser that, you know, just clicks a few buttons in order to get, you know, the fully um, complete HTML that is actually ready for us to parse. That's another, like, scraping part, you know? Yeah. When you do, and uh, we use headless if uh, we need to do an additional request, like, Mm -hmm. uh, well, request with JavaScript. But this case that I'm describing is um, that the data is already there. There is no any additional request. So, um, but the thing is that uh, when you go to the search engine, uh, and there is a section of questions with expandable bars, Mm -hmm. and when you click on that bar, the JavaScript uh, runs and it takes some da- piece of data, you know, HTML it puts it into that box. Okay. So yeah, in that case, we kind of had to, you know, think about logic that happens, you know, think what the front end uh, programmer was intended to do. And you kind of have to well, replicate that on the parser level. So mm. th- that's, that's, uh, 
uh, the challenge. I'm guessing that in this particular case, evaluating the JavaScript was a little bit too expensive, and that's why like you weren't running a full like yeah. browser in order to yeah. get the the HTML that you actually would need to use to actually parse the data easily. Exactly, that's the reason that we we can can't afford ourselves at the parsing level to just you know fire up a headless browser because mm -hmm. it takes resources and it takes time and you know we we have to you know, parse it uh, fast okay um so what you did there if i'm understanding you correctly what you did there you were just looking at the javascript code and you replicated the whole thing but in python uh, well, similarly to that, with some parts of the, the JavaScript that runs, we have to replicate those actions you know, mm -hmm. to be able to get uh, the, the data, get the full HTML, then we could uh, load it to the element tree and, and, and do the parsing. How do you monitor parsers in general? Like, I mean, yeah. we talked about the usual case where you have to write um, selectors that withstand some turbulence within like changing websites right but the scenario where a website completely changes is still probably possible um well not probably it's definitely possible that some you know front-end developer that maintains another website will suddenly decide oh this is a good day to update our website and our whole design so in those particular scenarios, your selectors probably don't work anymore. Um, how do you? It's how do you possible. Yeah, you're right. It's possible. It doesn't have happened so often, but uh, more we have like a slight changes in layout, slight changes in, in, in some elements, and well, visibility is a big part. Uh, visibility is becoming become a big part, and you know uh, your your client your service is a crucial part of your client's business mm -hmm. so we have to um, visibility has to be very important for us because we have to catch very fast uh, that our parsers is uh, not doing well so we constantly with visibility we constantly ask ourselves uh, how is our parser doing and uh, what's the success rate of our parsers so how, how do you measure success rate uh, well, we have this uh, status codes for our parsers uh, for the job that we, we do and well, you know, when we are uh, writing the parsers, we kind of describe what fields going to be, uh, what's the output. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, we might have like optional fields and we, but we, and we definitely have the required fields. You know? mm -hmm. So whenever we fail to parse the required field, that means that there's some error and that's an indication that maybe the layout change, changed or, or any um, other um, changes happened to the website. Okay. So we, if we have an error, we assign a specific uh, status code for the job. Uh, and we track those status codes. So anything less than 99% of success is, is kind of not acceptable. Okay. Um, it's kind of weird because what's the point of having required fields in general? I mean, wouldn't it be... Okay, I'm going to assume that you're going to say something like, um, you know, you're scraping an e-commerce website. And one of the required fields would probably be something like the title. And if you can't find the title of the product, then you know the whole job goes to hell, basically. Exactly. Yeah. But um, I'm thinking, isn't it, isn't it better to um, fail to parse the title and then return everything else? Mm, well we actually do that yeah if we just fail to parse some required element doesn't mean that we just you know uh, fail all, all job mm -hmm. uh, we do return the result oh. uh, but we clearly indicate that this field has an error we have we failed to parse this field. okay so uh, but there is case when we fail the job because we, sometimes we just I know it's it's uh, example that comes to mind if you won't find the uh, body branch you know in the tree that's right yeah. those are like critical just get failures stopped. yeah that's a critical failure because if there's no body you basically can't find anything in the elementary yeah I can I can understand that are there a lot of cases like this when we have to well, critically fail uh, the job no I or, mean uh, in general when like websites are changing their design and then yeah that's 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 our life <laughs> you know um, marketing guys doing like a b testings and so on the website change evolve and, and that that's that's everyday life so um 
you know in our office we have on the on the uh, on the wall these big screen TVs with uh, Grafana dashboards mm -hmm. you know, where we can clearly see what's the success rate of our parsers and we even have this uh, parser duty thing that's a uh, rotation that? every week we have uh, one person assigned to the parser duty so uh, his task is to just watch those screens watch the Grafana uh, dashboard and you know react quickly if we see that something is failing you know if we have uh, do they have to wake up at night to fix those uh, changes not at night <laughs> yeah not at night but that's that's no so um, it's like a specific um, job that you give one of your colleagues to just respond quickly to websites that yeah. change their design. Yeah, because it's a thing, you know, websites they change probably have to like drop everything that they're doing and, and go to fix that particular website. Yeah. Or, or do you still like consider the priorities of, of fixing a particular parser? Uh, that's that's a priority, yeah, because we can you know, the, the have to deliver the, data, you know, and then... The parsers that you already have are the priority. Okay. Yeah. What kind of um, other like breaking things in the parsers have you noticed within the last year? Have there been situations where like parsers just in general stopped working? Mm, uh, just in general, like uh, what do you mean? Mm, any sort of like downtimes that you remember that you had like with parsers in general? Uh, it's rarely happened. Uh, we kind of know. The, the stability of our services is also like the crucial part. So uh, we, we try to make sure that we wouldn't have any downtime. Uh, so, so no parsers went completely down within the last... Maybe it was some cases, yeah, but okay. it's definitely not but often. You're yeah. just not aware of it, I guess. Um, all right. So... I mean, you know, uh, just on the topic, like... Uh, it's very important not to release something uh, bad to the production uh, server. So, of course. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of have to do this testing of the code. You know, we try to prevent any, anything that you know, might, might uh, create this downtime. So. Right. So how do you test your parsers then? Um, well, ironically, we don't write any test uh, for for parsers. Uh, but the, how do you know that you didn't break your parser then? It's... Uh, it's cool thing that we have uh, in the in the parsers is that uh, we have these two files uh, for each um, well parsing case like our target website mm -hmm. uh, which would be like one file is the fixture uh, which is which is a JSON file uh, it has some metadata about the job and most importantly it has an HTML of the target website mm -hmm. and the other file this this uh, golden file it's like a source of true you know, mm -hmm. the expected output of the parsers so whenever you write uh, any changes on your uh, code uh, you kind of run the tests uh, yeah and uh, it takes the input file uh, the fixture and it matches looks uh, that do we match or not you know, with the, this golden file so what i'm hearing here is that you don't have unit tests but you have functional tests yeah it would be like functional test okay so i'm hearing that um there's quite a lot of nuance to parsing in general but i'm also wondering about what do you think the future is like how is the future of parsing going to look like well i think like uh, a lot of things uh, are impacted today by the machine learning yeah so same as uh, with, uh, with this field with parsing field i think the machine learning will, will do more and more uh, will replace more and more manual uh, tasks that we do and to be fair like even now in ox labs i, I believe that we have this grasp of future you know uh, here because we have this universal parser uh, it's done by our r d department and we already have it in production our clients are using it uh, this fascinating piece of software uh, i always think if i would have it back then when i was freelancing it would be um, I would made a fortune okay. <laughs> no, at that time, but basically, so that piece of software doesn't have to know anything uh, about the target website, and you provide the HTML document uh, of e-commerce page, and it kind of gives back you, gives uh, back you the parsed uh, elements. Yeah. 
So is this for e-commerce right now? Apple? Yeah, it's for e-commerce. Oh, uh, I see. So I'm guessing that one of like the ways that um, Oxlabs is going to improve is just by keeping um, that we'll keep working on this particular universal parser and that we'll probably make it work for SEO websites as well, maybe? It might be. I don't know the, uh, these plans, but uh, I believe that it should be, you know, mm -hmm. and eventually we will just be in Mexico drinking margaritas and uh, machine learning will do that. Hopefully, or maybe we'll find something else interesting to do. I'm guessing that when it comes to scraping, parsing and everything like web scraping related in general, there are there's always going to be work for us. And um, even when machine learning gets developed, I'm pretty sure that for the next 50 years, we'll still have things to do. Um, <laughs> I mean, from one side, you would like hope that machine learning improves enough to um, uh, basically allow us to parse websites easily. But, you know, not everything that we do here in Oxylabs is just, you know, about the scraping or about the parsing. Pretty sure that by now we consider ourselves a data extraction company rather than just mm. parsing one. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So I'm guessing, you know, if you were to ask my personal opinion, I'm pretty sure that we're going to work on like products that mm, maybe allow clients to write less code and instead like get specific parse results for themselves without having to write any code at all, like almost like a no code platform. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, crawling, right? Um, when you think about scraping, parsing, um, if you watched our previous episode, you probably heard about the term crawling and I'm pretty sure you know about it already. Yeah. Um, it's a topic that I want to introduce to our viewers on our next episode. I'm hoping that you guys will stay around uh, and find out what we have to say about this particular topic. That being said, I'd like to remind you all that you can find us on SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. I'm pretty sure I'm not forgetting anything this time. Um, and you know, guys, scrape, scrape responsibly and parse safely. Bye-bye.